A few weeks ago, I did a critical thought about why everything has become an RPG these days, with the likes of Call of Duty, God of War, and the many, many mobile and live service titles. But as I've been working on my RPG design book, for today's topic, I want to talk about things from a monetization standpoint, and why there is really good money in adding RPG systems to games. Oh, I'm sorry, a lot of money. No, no, wait, one more time. A license to print money amount of money in these games. RPG progression and systems is arguably one of the most addictive aspects of video games and game design. And that in and of itself is not, you know, me slamming these games. It is just the very nature of these titles that drive people to play them. Customization and being able to chart power and growth are very effective forms of player engagement, as we have obviously have seen over the past 10 years, with more games adopting RPG-based systems and design. We, as you know, humans and game players, and whatever, we love to see and chart progression and growth. If I swing an axe and I do five points of damage, okay, 10 hours later, I swing an axe, I do 7.5 million points of damage. Well, that's a really big deal. And RPG progression like this, it can work in, well, as we've seen, literally any system with any kind of aesthetics or design. Watching numbers go up in a game like Cookie Clicker is just as addicting as watching numbers and stuff flying up and over on screens in your favorite bombastic RPG, or getting that new ultra-rare assault rifle in your favorite first-person shooter or role-playing shooter. And as I've said, this has not gone unnoticed by developers and publishers, and why there has been this push to add in more RPG-based systems and design. As we talked about last time, Customization is a huge aspect of this, and so is the act of the infinite scale. That it's not about the player reaching a point where they just say, I'm the master of the game. It's about providing that ever infinite carrot on the hook, or carrot on the stick to chase after. And this also has been used as a buffer for lesser players. If I'm playing a game like Elden Ring or any Souls like and I can't dodge for anything, well, let me just wear the heaviest armor, max out vitality, and then laugh as bosses do like 20 points or like 3% of my health bar per massive combo. And like we said, this is one of the good things or the benefits of RPG progression. But when it gets tied to monetization and to utility, this is when it gets very gray in terms of whether or not this is ethical or fair to the player or player friendly design from my last book because when you are selling utility that does not have the same kind of quantifiers or qualifiers that we see from older monetization games that basically just tie flat power or time spent into their monetization and as we talked about the last time, a lot of you may still think of mobile games as these simple little things for your non-gaming friends and family to enjoy, your Farmvilles, Clash of Clans. But over the past five to six years, mobile has evolved to once again trying to attract core and hardcore gamers. Games like Azure Lane, Ark Knights, Genshin, Punch and Grey Raven, and many other titles our design around very advanced RPG systems and design. Because they know that gamers love to customize. They love to theorycraft and try different builds and different weapons and all that. And that is something that there is no limit to. Every aspect of a game's design, every aspect, excuse me, aspect of a character, skills, stats, whatever, that can be tweaked. That can be adjusted, and that does not directly correlate to power. And again, this is how monetization has changed in this respect. When we look at older mobile games and live service games, 
money just equaled time skip. If I gave you $10,000 in a game like a Farmville or a Clash of Clans or any kind of idle based game, that could equal five to six months of progress, maybe a year's worth of progress. But then that runs out. So all you essentially did was buy a shortcut where everyone else can eventually get to. Well, you see, for today's mobile games and monetization, it's about spending money to acquire utility. If I spend $10,000 in a game like Arknights or Genshin or any other kind of modern mobile style games, first I'll get weird glances from my bank about that. But what I will get is utility. I'll get six stars and URs and SSRs and whatever other acronyms you can come up with. Those in of itself does not create power. If I am horrible at a game like Arknights, giving me all the six stars in the world means nothing. And a lot of players can do a lot of that content using the free characters. But you see, getting those great characters grants me utility. It grants me something that I wouldn't have ac oops, you know, that I wouldn't have had access to otherwise. So in like an Arknights example, when I did my Is It Pay to Win episode, and I mentioned that character Mudrock, which in a surprising turn I pulled as a random <laughs> six star during one of their major events in 2022. Getting that character doesn't magically make my account perfect. It doesn't make me a better player. But it provides a new and unique aspect of utility that I wouldn't have access to otherwise. And this is where we get to how monetization RPG systems work. It's no longer about designing things around pure power. Say I'm playing a shooter and I get a gun that shoots 2.7% faster or does 2.7% more damage. That's great. But numbers by themselves will always lose their appeal as the abstraction gets higher and higher. Going from 10 points of damage to 1 million points of damage, it's a big deal. Going from 9.75 million damage to 10.3 million damage, okay, it's more numbers. But let's go back to that gun example. Instead of getting a gun that does more damage, let's say I have a gun now that has a modifier that it increases reload speed by 25%. Now I'm using the ultra rare magazine that every time I reload my gun, I gain 15% more damage for 10 seconds. And I have the super special helmet on that whenever I gain damage increase or any buff, I also gain 30% life steal for 20 seconds. Now we have something I probably just cause like a dopamine rush for a few of you watching this. And this returns to the earlier concept, or the earlier point. Is it player-friendly design to sell people utility? To sell them something cool and something else that they can use in their game? It's not directly related to power. And again, this is where defenders and critics will have this argument. The defender of the system will say, well, you don't need that super fancy wizard or that amazing buffer supporter class you can make do with the regular characters. But when you see, and again, when these characters and options are designed, they are meant to get you to spend money. Duh, I know. So tell me, would you rather play a RPG where you have a bog standard archer who just shoots an arrow, does damage? Or do you want that anime woman with hair that fills the entire screen when she shoots an arrow she shoots it up into the moon and then the moon explodes and all the chunks fall down and each chunk does 800 million points of damage and has a guaranteed chance of stun and then a 70 percent chance of defense break four or five turns also i made up that example while i was writing the script in my head so i don't know if there's actually a mobile game that does that but if there is a character in a game like that, please let me know in the comments down below. But again, when you sell the player utility, it provides an X factor that will greatly engage or disengage certain consumers. 
let's say I'm playing an RPG and I really like pet classes or buff supporting classes, and you decide to release a new archer. Okay, it's a new character, but it doesn't go with my build. It doesn't go with how I want to play the game, so I ignore it. Then you introduce a banner for a limited time character who it provides a never, no other character has access to this specific buff. And let's say the specific buff also multiplies on pet characters or pet classes. Well, guess what? Now for that banner, I'm going to go all in and spend who knows how much money in in game resources. Because if I don't get that utility, my whole team is going to suffer for it. And some of you may have may be thinking, well, this sounds a lot like digital games or digital trading cards or CCGs and TCGs. And it is that very same thing. And we could argue that the TCG CCG model kind of is the originator for this kind of utility. That anyone who's played any kind of collectible card game over the past 20, 30 years will tell you that Having a really good card in your deck is great. If you don't know how to use it, or you think just stacking all ultra-rare cards will magically make you the number one Yu-Gi-Oh! player or Pokemon Online player, it doesn't work like that. And it's also why, as I talked about in an earlier video, when it comes to meta play and metagame, that there is huge money involved in this. That if a new character comes out who, let's say, is the ultimate de facto best pvp character for this live service game every single person on youtube and twitch is going to talk about it and every one of those people who sees those videos they're going to try and pull it on those banners and surprise surprise a lot of money is going to come in to the developer during that time we have seen this in again pick any gotcha or monetized monetization driven live service game as i'm recording this right now Arknight is having their big three and a half year anniversary and in a surprising twist i pulled the two banner characters in about 108 pools and i didn't need to spend any money i just hoarded all my resources for this one event that's great for me i now have have access to that utility there are people who have spent hundreds of dollars probably into the thousands, to try and get those characters. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But I can tell you that the Arknights developer right now is probably having a pretty nice payday. And as I've said, utility as a form of monetization is where we see this connection of RPG progression. That it's something we can put our finger on. It's something we can qualify in terms of value. Saying that this sword simply increases my damage by 800 points. Okay, would you spend $5 on that? Maybe. But would you spend $29.99 on, on a brand new character with unique abilities that no one else has access to who can perfectly complement your entire team? A lot of people would say hell yes to that. And they have done that and they have probably spent a lot more than $30 to get those characters. So to wrap things up, RPG progression is highly addictive. It definitely hits something or sparks something in that lizard part of our brain. We like to see things grow. We like to be able to see going from early to mid to late game, end game, so on and so forth. And many games these days are being designed explicitly to capitalize on that. That it's no longer about just saying, give us money and we'll give you power. It's give us money and we'll give you new tools and toys to play with. And those tools and toys to play with are obviously better, shinier, and more interesting than just playing with, you know, standard stock building blocks or tinker toys and when you add depth on top of that where it now becomes this puzzle of okay i have this amazing character and this amazing perk how do i build a team or a deck or a party or whatever 
to complement that. And that leads into this kind of greater depth to these games. Where again, it's no longer about just saying, whoever spent the most money is immediately a hit. It's now, who figured out this game first? Who used the best characters or the best cards and has built that number one meta solution, the one that will take you from 0 to 99 instantly and make you the top five players on the server? And developers know how to capitalize on that. Because again, with power just for the sake of power, yes, it is an infinite scale, but it gets tiresome. No one wants to, no one's going to get the same dopamine hit, again, going from 10 million to 11 million points of damage. But when you introduce that banner for that limited character who, again, no one else can compete with because they're so unique and the person gets that SSR pull, or if they just get the SSR animation, that's when that dopamine flows. So with that said, let me know what you think in the comments down below. For some additional dopamine, if you buy 15 copies of each one of my books, you will gain plus 6 in your game design stat and at least 4 points in game design analytic abilities. So be sure to check them out wherever books are being sold. Be sure to visit our Discord and Patreon link down below and come back for daily discussions on game design here and on Game Wisdom where you some of the art and science of games.